I have come here to chew bubble gum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubble gum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hello there, welcome to another new episode of Cinema Royale, where we keep it classy most of the time. I'm your host, Mike Mixtape, and we have a full house today for this particular episode. Here, let me introduce you to the brotherhood and sisterhood of cinema here. First up, we've got James Sullivan, also known as Homitude. Two nights broadcast is brought to you by representing the topic at hand. I got my t-shirt ready. I got these guys ready. And I got a little familiar jingle, right, Sketchpad? Yes, of course. Uh, hey, yes. there is Yogi Bear. Well, let me just say, James, I see all your stuff, and I read you this. Oh, boy. <laughs> read, read it away, motherfuckers. Oh. And all the stuff on my desk. <laughs> what? Never in all my years I thought I'd hear something like that from you. Mm. I'm a grown up. Cheers. <laughs> Next up is Matt Bernales, known as Animat. Yo, guys, I figured to be here. I mean, we're talking about Hanna Barbera. I, it's, it's honestly been years since I've. Like really delved into it, so it's going to be interesting to return to this. Let's find out. <laughs> <laughs> Pitch is still too low. <laughs> Sorry, there's no Sony, so we're quite safe. Okay. Uh, I need to tweak my right net a little more. Hang on. <laughs> oh god. Oh, you have to go all out with it. Oh. And up uh, that was dark. That was harsh, man. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, we love Sorry. you anyway, Matt. Huh? <laughs> we love you, Matt. Up next is Morgan Ledger. And as you can see, I'm well cuddled in bed because I'm right now not wearing any pants. Film at eleven. Mmm. For all the vaulting fangirls out there. Just go give it a <laughs> Jokes and for all the vaulting oh. fanboys out, and for all the vaulting fanboys out there, why? Because I can. That's what I said last year. When were you hosting vaulting? No, not for that. I know what he's talking about. And that was the best day of my life. Morgan, do you remember? Damn, what was it? Oh! Ah, there you go. Oh, I think I burned those photos. I thought it was why you sat in the mood to do that review. And we, were, and we got to see every bit of your glory apart from your little animat. <laughs> oh, it's that. got a name! <laughs> you named it, not. That, that was her. <laughs> oh, yeah, so they're doing Alice the Looking Glass over now. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, the. Uh, I, I, I thought but, your friend hey, still but. Still more pleasing than the movie. <laughs> I think I broke Uncle Michael. That personally, personally, you saw more of my legs compared to yours. Well, no, I mean, not... if you're talking about the hair, that is true. Introductions! Podcast! Anna Barbera! Something like that. <laughs> Captain Peach Fuzz. Um, after... <laughs> Sketch <laughs> After that is uh, my lady, Steph Felton. <laughs> Uh, I can't believe I'm doing another a podcast with another British person, so it's so great. So, and in honor of that, tonight's broadcast is also brought to you by. I thought all Canadians were meant to be polite. Say you're sorry. Eh? Not after a good meal. You've got to do my dance. Go on. 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 Go
Why do I for any of the You know the ironic, you know the ironic was... thing is, is that I actually have that for supper on the side. Mm. We are the token. <laughs> Anyway, for the British kids out there, that was a hit of nostalgia because that was the Tweenies would do the lollipop. Oh, God, the Tweenies. <laughs> and last but not least, our special guest for this episode, Michael Kimpton, also known as Sketchpad within our group. Hello there, I am Sketchpad, and I can assure you I am very, very afraid. Sketchpad the quack? Not quite. Okay. I don't fly planes and I don't crash into things. Okay, I don't fly planes. Okay. Here's Huckleberry Hound. Also, if I'm allowed to do a quick shout out to all the people in Braintree, because as we're filming this, it's the 10th of June over here, so happy Carnival Day! <laughs> oh man. Um, I'm Huckleberry Hound. Oh my darling, oh my darling. Oh my darling Clementine, I you can't know, sing the rest of this properly because it's way too dark. I I, I know I, I know I showed this to Mike, but there's that one short I really like where he goes against a little tiny termite, and the termite keeps eating like his, his veggies and stuff, and the little termite goes buzz 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 buzz. Why is it the one that I always remember is uh is the the one where he's trying to get a photograph of a leprechaun? That exists. That ex that's an episode. Huh. I, thought it was, it was... Uh, I thought it was a modernized version of Dogu Gil and the Little People. <laughs> mm. So, anyways, yes, this is a discussion about Hanna Barbera. Anything that they produce, whether it's television, films, and or any little miss little thing in the middle. And I figured, uh, since last time we had Michael Kimpton, it was the Harry Potter episode. We had this whole hilarious bit where we were pitching a little sports movie in the Harry Potter universe and all of a sudden there was a smart idea of having Hannah Barbera cartoons popping out of nowhere and I was like, you know what, I should do an episode on this on this, because it'd be clever to talk about nostalgia cartoons uh, and... No, no, hold, no, hold up, hold up, hold up they did do something sports related, it's called the Laugh Olympics Yeah, but it, it was crap Oh uh, yeah, yeah Wacky Waste is awesome. Wack, wack. Oh, I loved it as a kid. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Creepy kook. The, the two cavemen, the sludge brothers. <laughs> it turns out they were always by each other. So yeah, we're just... Mm -hmm. This is open discussion, so we don't need to like go around and just talk about every little thing. We just can talk about whatever we want to talk about, basically. We know the history because mm -hmm. Animat did an animation look back on it. I'll link you to that if you guys are interested in that. But it's the other... first video I saw that he did. Mm. Yep. Okay. So it's up for discussion. Everybody can take the stand and just choose something to start out with, with whether it's uh, something that you want to go out with. Yeah, I guess we can go out into the start, which is actually very interesting how um, even though the style itself is completely different than what we know of Hanna-Barbera from today, but... Uh, why don't Why don't we go s beginning with their career in uh, MGM with Tom and Jerry? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I remember they did a couple of shorts with them on that. A couple of shorts. They were the ones who created it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we ain't talking about. Hey, this ain't no Tex Avery property. When I When I was a kid, Just all seven. I remember. When I was a kid, all I remembered was Tom and Jerry. I could barely remember who produced and created. I was like, Yay, Tom and Jerry! Who are these other people? I don't care. Yeah. Tom and Jerry yeah. is made by Walt Disney. But, um... <laughs> no, it's, yes. It's made by... It's made by Warner Disney. <laughs> yeah, so... You might as well be saying, Oh, yeah, I know my superheroes. Batman's my favorite Marvel character. <laughs> so, yeah, the, uh... I was they, young back then. They started out, um, Don't worry, we've all done it. Yeah. Okay. My out favorite with, uh, comic character is Howard the Darkwing Duck. That was good. Uh, James, so you were saying it, something. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I believe their their first episode ever was uh, Puss Gets the Boot. Uh, at the time, it was um, uh, they they it was a cartoon about a cat getting in trouble with a mouse, and uh, uh, Jasper was the name of the cat. The the mouse didn't. Uh, name. Jinx. Jasper! Jasper? Yep. Incidentally, um, 
in case any of you didn't know, um, we all know that William Hanna would go on to do the screams for Tom in those cartoons. But originally, all the screaming cat noises were actually by Donald Duck's voice actor, Clarence Nash. Huh. Oh, the shrieking noise. The shrieking cat yeah. stuff? Yeah, I apparently know when it's Tom Clarence Jerry's Nash. Birthday is. I know when uh, Tom and Jerry's birthday happens to be the 10th of February. What about who did the uh, No One Will Believe It voice? Don't oh, that would probably have been William Hanna. It. Yeah, it would still be Hannah. Yeah. Wasn't that uh, Frank Morgan? I can tell it's it's it totally seems like a Wizard of Oz moment there. But anyway, um, MGM, so yeah, they could have used it. Uh, so yeah, after that little success, they they didn't quite uh, picture themselves going on with more Tom and Jerry shorts. They they figured they'd uh, do a little bit more, branch out, do some other stuff. And then a producer calls him up and says, hey, why don't you do any more cat, cat and mouse cartoons? I like that one that you did. And so they picked a couple of names out of the hat, and thus Tom and Jerry became a thing. Mm. And, it's so weird uh, nowadays, because it just those two names sound like, you know, those two names just go so well together. It's just, it's hard to they're, imagine they're that it's just synonymous. pure luck. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like and, the, only, uh, the, if the only other name that would go so well with Jerry is Ben. Mm. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> and ever since, uh, and ever since then, it has been known to uh, uh, to uh, be promulgating uh, pro-Israeli propaganda. <laughs> my favorite chocolate, my favorite chocolate chip cookie dough. There's a that was an extra we've got over here. Oh yeah. Yes, uh, yeah, we've all heard that one. I know. Yeah. yeah. Who cares? The uh, who cares? The ice cream's still nice. <laughs> I like the chocolate brownie. But no, um, much like with the Wiley e. Coyote and Roadrunner cartoons, it's something so simple and basic. It's just cat and mouse getting mischief, cat and mouse chase each other. Uh, the, there's such a wide variety of things they could do. There are musketeers at one point. It seems like as if something that should be so simplistic, they did so much stuff with it. Mm -hmm. And the violence as well that really added oh. to what they were doing. I mean, you know, I mean, like that was the one cartoon that really did innovate the whole chasing cartoons. It, like it, it really is the one that like kind of really exemplify the like what we know today as like the count the chaser. like the cat and mouse chase yeah. mm, you know, that's it, <clears throat> it's a it's a formula that that's that was actually for a while heavily imitated and ironically when uh, when they started doing uh, Sylvester and Tweety shorts over at Warner Brothers uh, before they called him Sylvester, they called him Jasper. No, 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 no. They called him Thomas. They did. Yeah, it was originally Thomas. Oh, uh, yeah, that's like, right. Oops, MGM got it. Okay, change it to Sylvester. Say, does really? Anybody, does, yeah. does anyone? Does anybody remember like, do you, the? You, like, check out uh, tweet. Like, check out the cartoon Tweety Pie, and you'll see. Yeah. He, he's referred mm. to as Thomas. Does anybody remember the controversy behind the great Cat Churto? Oh uh, yeah, yes. how it got. Um, I, I think so. I yes. It, it, it was, like, it, is it related it was to the uh, Bugs Bunny cartoon as well? Yeah, it said there oh, were, there's and a, Bunny. Mm. Rabs Rabbit Rhapsody and the Cat Concerto. Yeah, yeah, they were. They did two separate cartoons, and nobody knew they had the similar idea, and they started blaming one over the other over who took the idea. Even playing the same song. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I I would love to have been there the night with it because it was literally a case where they did the cat concerto, which is Tom playing, you know, Hungarian Rhapsody on the piano whilst t Jerry the Mouse is trying to distract him. And then that goes, you know, they finish that, they're clapping, and whatever. And then the next one comes along, Rhapsody Rabbit. Guess what? It's Bugs Bunny playing Hungarian Rhapsody on the piano while the mouse tries to distract him. And of course, the uh, Warner Brothers people claiming they're not having stolen anything. How about Barry blaming those? Like, I wish I was there that night just to see the. Happen. What I remember, well, if you were that uh, that night, you'd be that pretty one old is a, now. Uh, from what I remember, that one, the uh, Rabbit Rhapsody, that's a Freeling cartoon, isn't it? I I think so. He I would usually do the music ones if it would end up having like dancing or something like that, because he had his like major animators like Jerry Chinicky who'd do all the um, dancing animations and things like that. So it probably was a Freeling cartoon. Well, it turns out, Michael, I'm a very young... Like, I was trying to remember the animation year. style and some of the movements, and it did feel like it was something out of Freeling. Yeah, but it yeah. probably was then. And they even, they even gagged uh, 
uh, some of the same yep. moments in the music. Yep, 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 yep. Rhapsody <clears throat> Rabbit was my first feeling. Yeah. So, like the the part where it uh, the um, the player skips up uh, uh, several octaves. It play, you know, they have a note that goes dun 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 dun. dun. In Cat Concerto, this this gag moment is played off with Tom's fingers stretching all the way out to the end of the to the end of the piano, and in the Bugs cartoon, it's played with him lifting his foot up and playing. Uh, yeah, I remember this one now. You yeah. gagged the same moment. It was essentially the same type of gag. This is some cold irony right there, but anyway... I cannot believe I didn't know anything about this. Um, really? They even did a Toon Heads episode on it. I, yeah, well, I, I only ever saw the Lost Cartoons Toon Heads because it was on the Golden Collection DVDs. I didn't really um, know that a controversy over these two cartoons existed. I thought they were, like, years apart, you know? That's ironic because the next year afterwards, Warner Bros. would get back at them by creating Tweety Pie... And that one would win the Academy Award for Best Image Short Film, which would which would break Tom and Jerry's streak of four consecutive wins. Um, words. actually, no, 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 no. Hold on, didn't Twe no? I think Tweety Pie came in first. Like they started with Tweety Pie because that was in the mid '40s, and Cat Concerto, like that one came in way way ahead, like at the end of, and at the end of the '40s. Yeah, yeah, so that would have been a relevant time to Rhapsody Rabbit. Yeah, that makes more sense. Mm. Yeah, Cat Gun Zero came first, and then it was Tweety Pie. Or Tweety Yeah, Bird. so basically they were just trying to capitalize on the success of Tom and Jerry early. And that maybe, um, I don't know, maybe someone at MGM heard about the idea of Rhapsody Rabbit and just did the same sort of cartoon as Revenge. I don't know. Like, we'll never know, probably. Mm-hmm. But, well, I mean, know, there, there is an entire backstory it. with uh, with uh, Tweety and uh, Sylvester. That was more of a coincidence. I don't think they did it out of, like, massive rivalry. No, of, um, um, what? No, I was just going to say... You... Oh, sorry. Cat Concerto, winner in 1946. Right. That was close. That's yeah, I was going to say, um, obviously, um, they must have... Um, they, they must have got on just fine about it later on because um, Frizz Freeling actually went on to aid William Hanna and Joseph Barbera with the uh, Yogi Bear movie as an uncredited uh, storyboard director. Mm -hmm. I think that was his job anyway, but we know I know that he was involved in the film somewhere, but it wasn't credited for the film. But Although so I, do, like... I do have an interesting question for you guys regarding Tom and Jerry. Uh, any of you guys have any thoughts regarding like some of the other ones later on, like from um, Gene Deitch or Chuck Jones? Um, well, I've already said that I really despise the Gene Deitch ones because um... nobody likes the Gene Deitch ones. They they were high. He had a team of animators who hadn't even seen a, a Tom and Jerry cartoon in their lives. Well, not to mention that. Not to mention. What was the one by Gene? What were the ones by Gene Deitch? Um, oh, the Tom and Jerry did... cartoon kit, Dicky Mo, um, yeah, it's Greek to me um, Dicky Mo, Dicky Mo, oh, those, Dicky Mo. Those Basically, ones. Gene Deitch was this guy who had animators in a uh, certain European country. I can't remember which now. I think it was Czech. Uh, Czech yeah, Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia. Yeah, so... He had all of them animating Tom and Jerry, and at the time, they didn't know Tom and Jerry. Like, Tom and Jerry wasn't available over there. Not only that, but Gene Deitch hated violent cartoons, and he openly despised Tom and Jerry. And so basically, he took it over as a means of um, trying to show people just how bad it was. In particular, he replaced the traditional um, black stereotype who was Tom's owner, uh, or the housekeeper at the place Tom was living, you know, Mammy Two Shoes or whatever her name was. He uh, they re replaced. He, he re yeah, but he replaced her and the, her replacements, all right, with um, apparently, I, I never watched all of these cartoons, so I never saw this character. Apparently it was a middle-aged man who yes. used to repeatedly yes. beat, beat the living shit out of Tom in an unfunny manner. Um, almost in an abusive manner 
just to show people just how bad Tom and Jerry was. So basically, to make Tom and Jerry Tom bad, him for the belt. basically to make Tom and Jerry bad, he made Tom and Jerry bad. Like yeah, re- he didn't try and improve the things he thought was wrong. Yeah. He just like did enough, what he thought was wrong say, with it. Oddly enough, and also I have to say that from what I recall, the Gene, like in terms of looks, the Gene Deitch ones are the most noticeable because they probably have the worst artwork among all the Tom and Jerry cartoons. The artwork is really awkward, but also the sound effects. That reverberation on every noise is just completely out of place. You actually uh, feel... When you're listening to the sound effects in those cartoons, you actually feel like those sound effects were being done in a cathedral. Like, the reverberation is just absurd. Yeah. And, I mean, even and, with... Uh, all... Even with the the Chuck Jones era that, that came after that, Chuck was... Uh, was was careful. It, his... His star, his style in there was very noticeable uh, as a as a change, I think, in terms of yeah. both design and animation. But um, at least he looks like, at least they look like he's trying. The, the only downfall is that Chuck Jones always likes doing big expressions and stuff. So when you see Tom expressing and all that sort of stuff, the only thing I can think of really is the Grinch. So every time I see those shorts, it's like, oh, it's yeah. the Grinch meets Jerry. And that's really really distracting, because with Tom, yeah, he got wide expressions, but not to, like, an over-characterized kind of point. And that's what I liked about Chuck Jones' work. He would always take something and have, like, this overly characterized kind of view to it. And that's why he worked really well with the Seuss films, uh, the Seuss shorts, because in the Seuss shorts, there were topsy-turvy, twisted, and it was just so surreal to the point that nothing looked very human-esque. And with Tom and Jerry, it was a household cat and a household mouse, and to so have and to have those over exaggerated qualities to them, it, it kind of shifted the comedy away from the typical cat and mouse violence to, oh, Tom is widening his eyes, or his eyebrows are getting thicker, or oh, here he is, he's about to suck a shark down a straw, and it, yeah, that actually happened once. He's oh, there's a mm-hmm. shark going through the straw, and oh, the, it's all about the reaction. It's not about the shark going after him. It's him reacting to the shark. You know what I yeah. find really ironic with the Chuck Jones ones is that, in theory, it should have been perfect. Because, like, you got Tom and Jerry, which is the most popular, uh, like, chasing cartoons ever created. And then you got Chuck Jones, who is the master of that medium with the Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner cartoons. You yeah, think, you think that, that he would do an amazing job with Tom and Jerry, but then it turns out it didn't necessarily work as well as you'd accept, expect because Tom and Jerry has this special formula that really does make it famous. But Chuck Jones has an entirely different formula that works more better with Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner. So I'm really enough is that everything. you think it would hmm. work, but it's like it doesn't necessarily function as well as you'd probably hope for. I mean, and here's say... some irony for you. Also, Roadrunner and Coyote uh... were created in response to Tom and Jerry. So, uh, Steph? Steph, are you alive? Oh, I, sorry, Matt just blew my brains out. <laughs> I will say not all the Chuck Jones shorts are bad. I think there's one where they, they open up with Tom singing opera and then it falls with Jerry going, Yeah, no, it's not, yeah, it's not bad. The cat and goofy cat. You know, I'm not saying that they're not, they're not bad. Like, some of them are actually quite enjoyable. It's just, they, like, the way that they come out, it's, like, they're, it, it's not as, like, grand, it, it's not as good as, like, the Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner cartoons. You've also got vocal sound effects by Mel Blanc, which for Tom and, which for Roadrunner is fine, but for Tom and Jerry, it's out of place. Yeah. Even Mel's voice is out of place in Tom and Jerry. Even though he wasn't talking, he was just doing vocal effects. Like you know, there's one mm-hmm. snowbody loves me in that ger- in that little um, in that little German village where um, or a Swiss village I think where yes. Tom is living in a cheese shop and tales uh, is that and stupid Bill's? doll that he he presented earlier. Tom comes Bloody... in and says he be tails and knuckles and you're going on a grand adventure and really smoking chocolate. <laughs> Where the fuck did that come oh, from? Yay! After that 
Crystal. Puppy power. Wait, if Mike's Sonic and if James is Tails, what does that make me? I know. Nipples the enchilada. You're Chris. <laughs> oh, I've got a tour to Dan. His grandfather, Chuck. He's got to keep calling you Marty. <laughs> what? Why am I Marty? Because you're Chris God and he boy. looks like Doc Brown. Uh, give me so it's like every time he says, every time he says, I, I need to talk to you, Marty. I'm Chris. Yeah, whatever, Marty. I'm going to have to tell Dan that. Sorry, this isn't related to Hannah Barbera in any conceivable way. It's because of him showing me that bloody doll. Okay. Well, then again, I mean, then again, Morgan, if it makes you feel a little better, you look more like a Morty than a Marty. <laughs> well, oh, it's a time out this way. What the fuck's going on? Well, it's kind of convenient. So I got to do two voices at once. Uh, shut up, Morty. You don't want to derail this whole podcast. Shall we uh, proceed to... Um... Well, the later yeah. parts yes. of um, yeah. Tom and Jerry. Yeah, this is the part yeah. where television comes in, and at that point, uh, what happens is that, what happened is that MGM would no longer be able to be making cartoons. So unfortunately, they had to shut down their their entire cartoon division, which oh. leaves Hannah and Barbara oh. wondering what they can do right now. So they thought to go tap into a market that Walt Disney has not even touched upon, which is bringing animation into television. Walt and already Jay Ward is like, I already did he that. He already used, what? Go on. Jay Ward is like, I already did that. Nobody loves me. <laughs> no, yeah, well, he, well, no, that Jay wasn't Ward really- came a... in a lot later, actually. Crusader um, Rabbit no, doesn't but... actually count as animation. Okay. I don't think. No, but the thing is- No, it that, has to move um, first. They figured why not try to, co yeah, like, Ooh. because Walt Disney Ooh, at I the time, he was only using television as a way of promotion for many of his movies and also for Disneyland. So they figured, excuse me, they figured why not make exclusive animation works onto uh, uh, television? So at least that can work out. So eventually they decided to go and like, what, when they wanted to create an um, uh, animation for television, they really sliced down the budget so that they can purely focus onto uh, the, you, they could pretty much focus on to like the writing the story and creating the characters and the animation would be just secondary they like they would just use their little change for whatever thing they can make with the first one that they've created which is uh rough and ready anybody has seen that yeah i saw a few uh, episodes clip of that. from your uh, animation that's back mm -hmm. actually oddly odd thing of all so i just want to quickly mention this um <laughs> Many people will know me, I um, did performing arts at college, and one of the things that we just literally had hammered into us about three damn times, because I did the level two and level three for two years, uh, is uh, felt Breck and Breck Team Theatre. And when um, I saw Matt's animation look back, when they talked about the animation style, where you focus more on story and plot, all that came to mind thinking like, hey, this sounds like Bertolt Breck's theatre, where you you know, you limit your sets and costumes and everything to remind people that they're watching a play. You know, I guess in a way it's the same with like Rough and Ready, they had to limit the animation so they can focus on story and voices. And I guess in a way it kind of reminds you that you are watching a cartoon. It's really mm -hmm. weird though. I mean, when you listen to the voices of the two characters, because it basically sounds like Huckleberry Hound and Pixie in the same room. You know, Pixie from Pixie and Dixie, um, which is the one Don Messick played. And then you've got Reddy, who is, you know, played by Dawes Butler, doing the same voice that he would later do for Huckleberry Hound. So when you watch those cartoons, it's just really weird, you know, with that in mind. And you realise you're a performing arts student, it's like you can't watch fucking anything on the telly without thinking, hey, this is like Brecht in theatre, or Breck, 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 Brecht on the brain. Like, criminal, I can't watch Criminal Minds without thinking about fucking Brecht. Hmm. I didn't do that, so I don't have that on the brain, thankfully. Yeah, just be thankful. Be thankful. Seriously, it was Stanislavski I mean, Breck, Stanislavski Breck, Stanislavski Breck for our main production, and then mm -hmm. we went into the theatre of absurd. Last, a breath of I grew up. When I grew up, it was at a time where if it wasn't puppets or talking trains, I wasn't interested. You know, so that's yeah, what it was like for me growing up. As a fucking godsend. And when I and when I was growing up, if it wasn't 
if it wasn't a cartoon, it wasn't worth it either. But eventually, it leads down to Huckleberry Hound, as we all know. <laughs> yes. I can't show you now because I've thrown it away. <laughs> you threw... uh, we got Pixie and Dixie and Mr. Jinx, which yep. which is a show which is a show that was is actually a trend uh, that you that you see ah. in Hanna Barbera from here on out. I think that at this point they no longer. Yep, there he is, Huckleberry Hound on DVD. I think. Yeah, I had to they... import this. Because they no longer uh, had had the rights to uh, Tom and Jerry, uh, because those were being produced overseas and Chuck Jones and all that. Um, this is basically they... what Pixie and Dixie is compared to Tom and Jerry. It's like they did Tom and Jerry and then Pixie and Dixie. Or what can we do to make it different? Oh, I know. Add another mouse and let them talk. That's Pixie and Dixie. I think they... the humor from that show really came more from the cat because he always mispronounced things. Come back, you little nieces. Now to have myself a ball. <laughs> I will say they did do a, a slightly reworked short years later in 2000, where Pixie and Dixie actually have a lawsuit against um, the cat. So they have like one a of those John order. Oh, yeah. Cartoons. yeah, one of the mid nineties ones. Or is it one of those like special blocks on uh, Cartoon, Cartoon Network? Network? Yes, one of those. I think they put a restraining clever. order on him. Literally. Just... John Chris Velucci did a lot of those, didn't he? He yeah, did Jetsons, that... Yogi Bear. Is that one of his, the Pixie yeah. and Dixie one? Because he used to talk a lot about Mr. Jinx on his website. I, I think that might be the one. Yeah. There's actually one that I, re uh, that I recently saw, actually, of something like that. And I remember it was my parents that showed it to me. It was, fr it was the Hillbilly Bears. I and, love uh, that. So they love decided that. to so all so come so together so in this Jerry Springer type show because they were having commu communication problems. Oh my problems. god. <laughs> like, Paul, I just feel like I don't understand you. <laughs> I want to know what it is that you're feeling. you take that back. And then, like, you see right at the end, it's like, um, the, like, the Papa Bear is just, like, full of trailer. And then suddenly, like, he brings out his gun. And, <laughs> then you see right on the wall, it's like, on the all, bullet po bu in the all bullets, I heart you, Mom. Like, Oh, Paul, I didn't know you cared about me that much. Me just I guess if you love me, that's all that really matters. I love it when he gets pissed off, though, because he still mumbles. It's just like, Shut up, God, I'm going to die. I just don't fucking love that. No, I know. Wait, wait, Sketchpad, the um, the one where that bear visits their house and he accidentally bites Paw's hands when he's in like uh, pretending to be a sandwich I or something. I think I hurt my sandwich. <laughs> 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 I fucking love that line. Brilliant. So, so I gotta. Yeah. Huh? Uh, I was gonna yeah. ask. Hmm. Hmm. The the trend that I was trying to get to was that for a while. Uh, Pixie and Dixie was one was one set of an imitation uh, of this of that particular uh, formula or trying to recreate the success. Uh, the other one was uh, the Motor Mouse show, I believe, from uh, oh yeah, uh, 1969 as part of a, a as part of the Catanooga Cats. Uh, I thought it was called Chattanooga Cats. Or Chattanooga Cats, yeah. That particular block. So, uh, yeah, that is quite a leap, actually. Um, it is. Where, it do is. Between... where do the banana splits fit in? That's yeah, 1968. That yeah, 68, oh, yeah. That's somewhere in the middle. 1968, James. Yeah, 68. We've got it. Don't forget, we've got it on DVD. You guys haven't. I envy oh. you. <laughs> They, they can't even restore the masters like oh they're way too dirty come on so we have um so how can so you make the have... video splits dirty <laughs> because they're they're actual videotapes from the 60s oh, could... oh not that dirty oh. yeah, they're like <laughs> one inch tapes they're one inch tapes that's actually okay, not I bad like but that's, that's actually pretty good when you consider 1968 like, you know, because they were still using two-inch quadruplex at the time, so to have one inch must have been pretty expensive. 
They showed one of the episodes on, um, I think it's Saturday Morning Cartoons, 1970s Volume 2, I think it is. And it looks in very rough shape. Surprisingly, mm. surprisingly rough shape. Oh, that's yeah, that's good. the one that lied about what content it had on it, wasn't it? Because it said that Rough and Ready was on there, and there wasn't any Rough and Ready on it. Mm. Yeah. So we reach uh, the 60s, and we have another type of formula that's success. The animated sitcom. Of course. Hey. Which is uh, um, my boy. <laughs> my boy. Not if, that boy. If if, if I didn't if I didn't my know boy, better. this piece is what all true warriors strive for. Hey uh, Fred, what? how come we yeah, celebrate Christmas and Jesus wasn't again. born yet? Shut up and eat your cereal, Bond. While that simple Bond, we actually have our own Jesus. <laughs> Oh my god, so dude, we've got to is... do a video! We've got to do a video, Matt! Oh, and we've got to do a video! Is Abe Vagoda. I gotta share this, I gotta share this. Please say I need a hot jacuzzi. Please say I need a hot jacuzzi. Uh, I ain't... Wait, like, in what in what way? Like, what's the tone? Oh, just that... Uh, I don't know, good burger, right. because Abe has his right. jokes in it. I need a hot jacuzzi. You join there it is. On? Just need to go and relax on a hot jacuzzi. Sorry, Fred, I'm not particularly interested. I don't think you're my type. <laughs> come on, Vine. You survive. Come on, you're stuck by me with all those sexual jokes in Beaver Rock Vegas. It's the least that you can do in a hot tub. Yeah, I don't think, if they were still alive, I don't think we'd be very popular with Hannah and Barbera right now. God, at first time we're in the Oh, Bob. <laughs> nah, not really. <laughs> I oh, don't think it could last time. that long. I'll just give, I'll just give that to James Arnold Taylor. You know, it actually throws me off with a guy whose voice is high as yours. You can actually do a convincing Fred Flintstone. It actually throws me off. With all due respect. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, no, that's the, that's the sign of a good voice actor. If you could surprise people with your voice, you got it. Hey, Fred, look, it's my vintage Red Donalds. Yes, that. Did you order from? Hey, did you take? Got can that from McDonald's? Say, <laughs> can you oh my God, say? I, <laughs> can you say I really need a jacuzzi in your English accent? Who me? Oh, really? Oh, really need a jacuzzi. Okay. I told you, Ringo, you're not allowed. Now get back in your fucking cage and redub Thomas Season 3! But I, but I just want to be in a jacuzzi. Oh, but I won't. I won't. Is there something we should know? If my ovaries could have been right well, now. I'm almost relaxing. I said redub Series 3. Oh. My demands are. Get me a jacuzzi first, and then we'll talk. So, Fred, the Flintstones. The Flintstones. How? How did? You know, I'll just say. Can I just say? Um, when we started this podcast on Hanna Barbera, I don't think anybody was expecting me to pull a sword out. So, um, I think we should get back on track now before people get really fucking frightened. Yeah, okay. Okay, let's continue with Hanna Barbera's The Honeymooners. Yes, oh, wait, Hanna I'm Barbera. Sorry, the, Flint the Flintstones. Yes, Hanna Barbera. The one thing in this podcast that we've started an hour ago that we haven't actually talked about yet. Um, yes, the Honeymooners controversy. Of course, um, Jackie Gleason, who was um, like, the guy. He, he was the... not happy, but then suddenly, like he realized he like if he would have done anything then he would have had the reputation of the man who would kill the flintstones so yeah it's like, like his lawyers basically his lawyers basically said to him yeah if you want to take this show down you can but you really want to be the guy responsible for taking the flintstones off the air you know because of how popular it had gotten by that point so yeah. mm -hmm. and and i loved that show i really did the idea that it was prehistoric <laughs> times and <laughs> Keep going, keep going. The idea going. that there was prehistoric times. And they were putting it in a modernized kind of setting. I think to quote Ray Harryhausen perfectly, the future's nice, but it's always fun to look at the past and see what there is. 
and just the whole idea that it's a civilization that's so based on taking animals and using them as like that's a whole bunch of the same stuff. crap, really. But, but or just maybe, the, but, or but maybe, just the, but just the way they're taking these things and just putting them in prehistoric setting. There's something so charming to it that always really fascinated me. They have like an elephant for a vacuum cleaner. They use like actual cars, but they're powered by their feet instead of gas. I always found that kind of interesting. I remember um, the Halifax Bank in the UK did a, did a Flintstones commercial recently. Mm. Um, and they did this joke where like, you know, when you change banks, you know, you get a certain amount of money. And then like the guy asks Fred what he's going to spend the money on. And he says he's going to get something to improve the performance of his car. So he buys shoes. <laughs> right, that's good a good gag. Kind of nice. mm-hmm. Which is really weird, because like, when Halifax started doing those ads, it's really weird. They went from Top Cat to the Flintstones to Scooby-Doo, and then to Thunderbirds. Because I know when we were doing the crossover in the Jetsons, um, I think I know we did this before, you loved the Jetsons, and I liked the Flintstones. Yes. So it was an interesting encounter right there. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, I liked what I saw of the Jetsons. I grew up with the Flintstones as well. Mm-hmm. But yeah, whatever what I did see of the Jetsons, I liked. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, have, I have nothing against the Jetsons. It's a nice concept. They're in the future and everything. I just thought with the Flintstones, they had a lot more fun with stuff because it was mm-hmm. the prehistoric time. So there was there, it's more stuff we can get away with. You know, what's Hollywood like? What's a driving like? What's, you know, a diner like? It, I just felt yeah. there was more going on there. My... Uh, please don't get me wrong when you do something in the future you always have that double-edged sword where you predict something and it comes true or if you predict something and it doesn't happen and a good example is back to the future part two if you watch that entire sequence in the beginning there's a lot of stuff that's kind of scary to imagine that what they predicted back then is kind of sort of true now oh yeah like skype for instance exactly and well yeah oh yes you can see like multiple screens on one television so uh, yes, I also invented Google Glasses. So when I look at something like the Jetsons, I always think to myself, okay, this is actually kind of cool. There are flying cars, the fact that the husband has to push a button to go to work and all that sort of stuff. It's like these are really neat ideas. But it really makes me wonder um, how that would compare to a modernized setting. And yeah, they definitely do get around the bed with certain things, like meals come in like little pills and stuff like that. Um, it's the basic prediction of the future, the flying cars, the fact that every structure is elevated from the ground and everything. But in a sense, it's like, okay, well, what more can you do with that? Sassy robot maids? All right. There's comedy there, and it works. Mm-hmm. You there, know, the there's, part, there's, there, there's parts where the Jetsons really do work and are interesting, but I felt... There was much more going on with the Flintstones because they had, like, a whole thing to play with here. Because it's it's in prehistoric times. They had dinosaurs and all sorts of creatures with the Jetsons. What I remember from that one is the hovercrafts, the flying cars, um, the, the robots, the science, and not really much else. Yeah, and if I could be very honest, I feel like with, um, with the Jetsons, the one thing that I do criticize is that... Um, it, it often feels pretty repetitive. Like, even as a kid, the one thing that I've noticed all the freaking time is that George would often get a, a promotion from Mr. Spacely, and then afterwards he would be fired back down. Like, it kept going on and on and on, and I've seen that so many times that it mm. started to feel like I'm watching the same thing happening. But, yeah, but just with that, different... I, or, like, the formula, at the very least, is starting to become... Basically... Very, very the same beginning and the same end, but just change the middle about a bit, basically. Yeah. yeah. Well, except for the time uh, Astro became a super genius and they tried to go in a game show. Or the time when Rosie the Robot had a love interest with this fix-it robot that loved her back. <laughs> My god, I haven't seen a lot of the Jetsons. I don't know what the fuck any of you are talking about. That, you see, it's, it's, I remember, it's, it's, in, the, it's, I, I remember in the 80s that weird, like... Yes, the, 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 little, white the thing with the spring. thing with the springs, yes. Orbity. Yes, Orbity. <laughs> yeah, during the, during the, um, uh, the, the reboot, or the re- revival in 85. If, if Howie Mandel voiced that thing, I wouldn't be too surprised. <laughs> I think it would be. <laughs> um. The freaky noise you made, Michael, reminds me of your cute Pingu impression. Not now. Not now. <laughs> I can't do that now. Okay. <laughs> But no, so... I, I, I like the Jetsons. It's well, it, it's not one of those. Hasta la vista, Pingu. <laughs> so, so, what did you... What did you... So, 
Were you, were you assassinating Pingu? <laughs> yeah, no, Pingu actually fought back against the Terminator. Pinku is Grand Theft Walrus. Oh, you're talking about another thing, okay. Oh, uh, not the walrus, one, not you're the talking walrus. About Pengu. Not like, the yes, walrus. One. Like, <laughs> so, no, 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 no. I was referring to the Simpsons. Stop. North, North. Let's not forget as well. Um, I mean, we, we are talking about the Jetsons as the alternate sitcom, but Hanna-Barbera during this time also tried to go back into the world of theatrical cartoons. Um, they did. Well, they started. They started in 1959 with the Loopy De Loop cartoons. They were actually theatrical productions. Oh, they weren't yeah. actually connected to any um, cartoons. They had a contract with Columbia to um, make those cartoons um, every few years. Um, <laughs> I, I felt so bad. Those cartoons put Mr. Magoo in the retirement home. <laughs> yeah, he belonged um, in the retirement home. Basically, it's like Loopy De Loop is this like French Canadian wolf who is very friendly and he wants to be friends with all the people but everyone hates him because he's a wolf and so they beat the shit out of him and things like that um but they were actually quite creative and between 1959 and 1965 they actually got 48 theatrical shorts done which uh, is quite a like lot the really. same kind of budget though Oh yeah, it's like still the tra the TV budget, but that's why Columbia took them on because like they could create theatrical cartoons on the cheap without actually having to demand so much money because you know theatrical cartoons were like fading out of out of you know what's the word uh, fading or oh, basically fading they were out dying of out. Pop culture. Oh, I mean like the Casper cartoons, for instance. They kept doing flashback cartoons where they kept recycling animation, and then when they did use animation, it looked it put Crusader Rabbit to shame. You know? Dang. It's like people would prefer to watch Clutch Cargo than those shorts, and they were theatrical. I guess we Judge Doom really was running the stylized cartoon segments then. But, you know, the, the, the Loopy De Loop cartoons did work, uh, because, uh, in fact, hang on, I might as well show you this, hang on. Uh... And as we keep going, let's see if you... Uh, this is an odd time... Uh, this is an odd time uh, in their... Here's, uh, a, here's a Loopy De Loop episode. On 16mm wow. film. Oh, is that God, an original? Have a film. Um, it's not an original, but... Uh, it comes on a nice little reel, and um, it's starting to rust up, I'm afraid. But um, it's got sound on it, and it's in colour, um, and it didn't cost me a lot. I just happened to spot it on eBay, and I thought I'd pick it up. Mm. Do you have a projector that have... you play? I'm afraid not, but if I had, I'd be playing it quite often, and thus it would break, so... Mm. Uh, hang on. I don't even know... I've... You know that they say it has that vinegar smell when it gets old? I've never actually... Um... Nope, it doesn't smell of anything, so uh, I think it's actually alright so far. Cool. Vinegar, shouldn't be put on, vinegar shouldn't be put on anything, not even films or even chips, so but, thank but god vinegar, it doesn't smell of vinegar. But vinegar is my secret ingredient. I like vinegar. Nothing wrong with vinegar. Yeah, it's nothing wrong. Wait, do, do, do you put, do, wait, do you put vinegar on your chips, Michael? Wait, wait. Of course! <laughs> That's what it's for! Whoa, man! To all That's of you? what it's for! To, to no. all of you... To... All of you oh. Courage the Cowardly Dog fans, you're welcome. Okay, I can understand the Marmite thing, but you've gone way too far. So, There's nothing wait. wrong with Marmite and jam. <laughs> Moving forward with, a, with a, <laughs> a couple more... A couple more of their creations we had uh, during this particular time. We had Magilla Gorilla, Peter Potamus, Adamant, and Secret Squirrel. How much is that grill in the window? Uh, Actually... My, one of my other one of my other favorites for a while from this uh, particular time period was Johnny Quest. I never oh, saw yeah, that. Oh yes, one of their what? first serious ones. <laughs> Sim Sim Salabim. I saw the '90s uh, Johnny Quest, the real adventures of Johnny Quest, but I never actually saw the original. I, I, I definitely I like the original. It, it had some good moments. Like, I think actually, I another interesting piece that they brought out was actually Space Ghost. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, before Space Ghost Coast, Coast to Coast, to Coast. He, had a, he had a TV show. 
Space Ghost and Dino Boy. boy. Are we all looking at the uh, Wikipedia article? I am. God damn it. And of course, we can't forget the ever so underrated um, Moby Dick and Mighty Might Tour. Never saw that. It's yeah, there's right. some. There's it's, some... It's, it's, it's no Herculeoids, but it's fun. Mind you, yeah. there is one cartoon Hannah Buffer did. I've not really seen much of it. Uh, has anyone ever heard of Sinbad Jr. and his magic belt? Uh... Is that all not before tonight. Right. Well. Basically, this cartoon started out as a, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to say it, hold your breath, a Sam Singer cartoon. Okay. Sam Singer was the man behind Paddy Pelican and Bucky and Pepito, the two debatedly worst animated productions ever created. Oh. Oh, Sam, yes. Sam Singer is considered the Ed Wood of animation, only there is nothing <laughs> remotely appealing about his work. But you he has this that cartoon. for Texas Jack. But what'd she say? Except for Texas Jack. You say that, and I raise you where the dead go to die. Right. Uh, right. But basically, um, he had this cartoon, Sinbad and his magic belt. Basically, Sinbad had this. It was a kid. He had this talking parrot, and he had a belt which gave him magic powers or whatever. But then Hanna Barbera took it over, and they got the parrot to be voiced by Mel Blanc, and uh, the cartoon suddenly became ten times funnier. Like. According to everybody, even Chuck Jones, who used to call Hanna Barbera Illustrated Radio, used to actually give him credit for making it work. I don't, I don't know if that's true or not, but it's said that that's what he said about it. And um, we've already, uh, we already talked the hell out of uh, Scooby Doo. Yes. Ooh, 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 ooh. Frankenstein Jr. and the Inc Impossibles. Never saw it. What? No, that was the shit. With me, it was basically um, the early '50s to the mid '60s, and then breaking off for dastardly and Motley, Honestly, like other than that, I didn't really. Wacky races, uh, yes. I honestly, I was never that big on wacky races. Funnily enough, I seem to find can... the episode. For me, I found the episode. Really? Has anybody watched my... the Snagglepuss cartoons? Oh yeah, they're on the Yogi Bear show. I love those. Yeah. Snagglepuss, their exactly. answer to the Pink Panther. Speaking of which, did, the... you hear, did you hear they were revamping the character for um, oh God. the comics? Oh, God. Have you seen the artwork on that thing? No, I haven't, it's actually. It's horrible. Like, Is it bad? Like, what they, like, I like the concept of it. It sounds cool. But the artwork, Jesus balls. Is it's it true so that they're bad. actually... Is it true that they're actually going to make him gay just because he's pink? Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Well, yeah. No, the no, thing he was flamboyant. He's a gay, uh, he's a gay playwright in the in the the late fifties in Washington D.C. I believe. But oh, what the still, heck am I that looking artwork, at? That they are trying to make him look so. Realistic. Let me see it. Where is they're it? They're trying to make him look like a real tiger. What am I looking at? Like, oh, there it is. Okay, I'm gonna look. It's like, <laughs> We have to be drawn. <laughs> oh, and also at the same time, um, uh, like uh, in the preview that they showed it, they uh, they also have Augie Doggy right next to him, and he's like a really yeah, that's cool dodgy, guy. isn't it? Wait, yeah, let's put wait, let's put wait. A, let's put him next to a fucking kid. <laughs> wait, 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 Mike, 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 because we know these characters too well. That <clears throat> is Snagglepuss. <laughs> Gee, dude, oh, the, what, do you, what, what about you... DC, though? They made a good uh, depiction with that... With, with wait, that. wait, wait. I, 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 gotta, I gotta get that sketch back. Hold on a second. Gee, Huggy, what are you and Snagglebush doing lately? You seem to be spending more time with him than catching ball with me. Oh, I've still been catching ball, all right. Have a Betsy. I've captured a lot of balls with do Doggy Daddy. Okay, my son, I think we better get the fuck out of here. <laughs> hey, boo-boo. What do you like, suppose is going on here? I, you wanna join in? I don't think you know, I want to. Augie, it's I not call a good your idea. Dad, da you know, I call him daddy. Oh, as come well. on, I'll show you what's we in my picnic relate. basket. Uh, you got that wrong, it's picnic basket. Picnic basket? <laughs> yeah, you just I got out picnic. Matt, did, I can't tell if I'm sleep deprived or whatever, but did you literally say Jesus balls? I think he did. Yeah. yeah. Does Holy remember... Crimble Crumpets. Does, does anybody remember the the animated Flintstone movies? 
Oh, I remember yeah. a long time ago, I the, saw, at one point, I saw a man called Flintstone. Yeah, I remember that I too. As that, well. I actually saw that recently. I um, couldn't follow that very much. Um, no, it, it doesn't hold. Yeah, it's very weird for the time. I mean, it was during the era of spy movies. Like, it was the 70s, right? That was... I thought it was the late... Son of a bitch. Hold yeah, on. That hold was on. a theatrically released deal, too. Yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on. Give me a second here to find the date. You're going very trippy here, Mike. <laughs> uh, nope. <laughs> August 3rd, 1966. So it was 66 when The Man Called Flusto came out. Because it was one of the last things that Alan Reed did before um, he retired, wasn't it? He also appeared in an episode of The Addams Family. Oh, yeah, but it was one of the last times he actually played Fred Flintstone. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was... Seriously, though, seriously though, do, do check that episode out. That's where they introduce Cousin Ned, and he has a great um, part as a, zoo, as a zookeeper. <laughs> He's trying to find a new act, and he puts Cousin Thing in there, and there's a lot of great reactions from him and stuff, and there's even a great bit from Uncle Fester where Fester threatens to shoot him in the back. <laughs> well, that sounds exciting. Mm -hmm. But then I realized that in the 70s, they started to do the Scooby-Doo clones, more or less. Scooby-Doo oh, yeah, like, uh, yeah, They've made Scrum. so many freaking Scooby-Doo clones. Like so many... Like the Josie and the Pussycats. And no, but then, they've also made a lot of like Scooby-Doo stuff as well. That's true, but... Like a lot, like the a lot of Scooby-Doo are... series. The two like films I remember... And keep in mind, a lot of them end up do being, like, really weird. One of that, that um, I remember, like, sometimes they'll add Scrappy, sometimes they'll add different characters. Right. Like, it's always Scooby and Shaggy, and sometimes Daphne is there, sometimes it's Velma. I and might be... one that I remember, it's, like, the weirdest Scooby-Doo character of them all. Anybody remember Flam Flam? Anybody, anybody remember who Flam Flam is? The one no. who just like a can... toad? Can't, Hang can on I a sec. Just... Can I, can I just say for the record, 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo was awesome. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What were you going to say, Steph? Well, that because it has been some... Okay. Yes. Vincent... Hang on. Whoa, 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 guys. Steph is trying to talk here. Let us say The two films I remember were um, Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island and Scooby-Doo and the Witch's Ghost. And as a child, I preferred the Witch's Ghost more. And I remember having it on a VHS that my parents recorded. And the first film was Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island and then Witch's Ghost. So I'd have to watch through Zombie Island to get to Witch's Ghost. Well, Witch's Ghost and Tim Curry. Yeah. 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 And there's no complaint over that. But isn't that I don't when remember the became... Hex Tales. Isn't that when they stopped having the title Hannah Barbarian? That was when Warner Brothers took them over. Yes. Yeah, yeah that it's... was. The, uh, the properties... Yeah, the the company went belly up basically, and and they. Um... Well, it was actually um, doing quite well because in the eighties it was sort of dying down because um, they made a lot of deals with Britain to um, create the fantastic world of Hanna Barbera, where they could create their own versions of uh, British products. Like they had their own series of Super Ted at one point, which um, for some strange reason. Um, uh, they got Spotty to be voiced by Krang from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and Super Ted, instead of being voiced by Derek Griffiths, who voiced him in the original series, they got him to be voiced by the red-haired kid from Terminator 2. Mm. Amazing. But it made a lot of sense when they broadcast it. it. The only two actors to come back were the guys who played Texas Pete and the Skeleton, Victor Spinetti and Melvin Hayes, but when they brought it to the UK, um, they actually got Derek Griffiths and John Pertwee to come back and Redub the voices of uh, Super Ted and Spotty, which was cool. But then, of course, like even with that decline, they also did Paddington Bear as well, which um, which was really weird because it was basically Charlie Adler doing um, for Paddington. He basically did an English accented version of Buster Bunny. Didn't they also have Paul which... Winchell as uh, Mr. Curry? I don't think. No, that was Tim Curry as Mr. Curry. Oh, damn it! That was. Yeah, they didn't. They, they, they got the curry to be the curry. They didn't miss an opportunity. I was about to say, it was like Tim Curry, like Mr. Curry did a Mr. Curry. Bear? Yeah. Why not to bear? Precisely. So, yeah, of course, now, we, now we come, of course, to the 90s, where we come to the golden age oh, the of Hanna Barbera. The 80s, man. Actually, still... you're, forget, you're skipping over one of my favorite eras uh, before the we go. Smurfs. What, Fantastic Max? 
Uh, that I was think... part of Fantastic World of Hanna Barbera as well. I yeah, think, it's like, uh, that, that's all I think of when it comes to the eighties. I think the Smurfs, and that's it. Mm, well, they they were also they also had the Flintstones kids, uh, Tom and Jerry kids. Man, that was a, Yo that Yogi. Was something they were really. Ah. <laughs> ah. Ooh, Yogi's treasure hunt. That that's okay. That's okay. okay. Yogi's treasure hunt was fine. Yeah, that yeah. had Big Dastardly in there, and that was great. Tom yeah, and Jerry Kit. My, my, wait, wait, my favorite, sorry, I just want to say my favorite episode from that series was that they had Dick Dastardly brainwashing him to get the treasure, information of the treasure out of them by just playing those Stop the Pigeon cartoons. Yeah, so they couldn't do anything but sing Sp Stop the Pigeon. And they also had, um, because, like, it was weird, because Quick Draw McGraw, uh, who we forgot about mentioning, uh, was the cartoon that preceded um, Yogi Bear, but came up before, just after Huckleberry Hound, because um, he had an alter ego, El Cabong. Now, for some reason, they decided to create two other alter egos for this cartoon. Now, I can't remember what one of them was. I think it involved Huckleberry Hound, but one of them was Ram Boo Boo. Ram Boo Boo? Mm -hmm. Yes, basically, um, it was basically uh, Boo Boo Bear with super muscles, wearing a bandana and talking in broken English. Me, Ram Boo Boo, me, tough. Uh, it was a bit fucked up. Where's, a muscle stuff? It still doesn't sound as bad as that cartoon that John K made. What let's Boo Boo know. and the Man? Let's let's not talk about it. Oh, no, we're getting to that, but first. God no, God no. The. That oh, Boo Boo goes so wild. But it answers yes. so many questions. It answers so many questions. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh, fuck! I love that cartoon. It's, it's terrible, but it oh, it answers God. so many questions. Uh. Like I was saying, yeah, they they had their Flintstones kids and then Tom and Jerry kids. They there was a there was that period in animation where they said, hey, let's uh, let's uh, take all of our popular characters and repopulate and sort of repackage them as younger versions. From what I remember, uh, like they were really profiting off of Muppet Babies, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. most likely. They had a popular worse stealing shit by then. And so. Actually, Tom and Jerry Kids was my was was my biggest introduction to that uh, to that to that particular franchise. But I look at something, I I remember rewatching the show, binging the hell out of it when I was uh, when I in high school and finally getting television again, and I realized something. There, when they ran out of, out of ideas with that show, they they were pretty much strictly remaking the classic shorts. Only with the the younger kid characters, and when they weren't, and when they ran out of ideas for that, they they tried they tried turning it into uh, in, into more of an ensemble cast show, which didn't really work. They turned it into um, that they they had a bunch of characters. They 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 had they had some great side characters like Spike and Tyke, Droopy and Dripple. Uh, to to name a few, but then they got really complicated after that. So exactly. <laughs> I have to say that was the most one of the most coolest theme tunes I ever heard. It was a great theme apart, song. Apart from apart from Astro Farm and William Swish Wentons, you know, nothing can beat those ones. Well, let's I've got to admit, there was, though, and then there was Bernie Bird, and you're like, who the who the heck is this? I got to admit, I like Junior and I uh, found a DVD of Tom and Jerry Kids one day, and we decided to watch it. And uh, we we threw it away after five minutes. We th like, with all due respect, the cartoon just was not as good as it was when we were growing up. Well, well let me put it this way: Would you rather have that or Laverne and Shirley in the Army? Uh, this was an actual cartoon. Right this <laughs> was an actual cartoon. I know it. That, that, that... Would you rather have that or the Fonz and the Happy Days gang? <laughs> exactly. Oh my god, it's just... Uh. Or the Pac-Man Little Rascals Richie Rich show? I'm trying to think of the most cringeworthy oh, thing right now, and I'm, thi I'm thinking about the car hop song from the Flintstones. Mork and Mindy, Laverne and Shirley. Does anyone know what Church. I'm talking about? Mm. Car hop. Oh, oh, the, the burger song from the driving episode. <laughs> uh. Yeah, the soundtrack I own calls it the car hop song. Um, bye, bye, bye. <laughs> Would you rather have that, have that or a shirt? Da -da -da -tails. I'll take my chances. 
Nope. Nope. Okay. Think if you listen to that car hop song, you will not get it out of your head. It's the most awkward thing I've ever watched. But it's funny as hell. Hey, hey, it, it leads a good payoff in the episode where um, yes, it does. Emma and Betty turn the tables and play the song on them. Like, I laughed so hard when Fred and Barney shrunk. Like, that Pink. was brilliant. That was just brilliantly timed. Pink Panther and Sons. Hey, yeah. Pink I Panther. That one. <laughs> I, I know. Well, he's barely in the in those in that show of period. He's just there on the on the marquee for the uh, for that value. But his sons take over the show, and it's like they speak. How come their How come their dad can't? Yeah. Anyway, Benji, Zax, and the Alien Prince. So we have we have the '90s. Oh, Capital Critters. That that was them. Yeah, but they also said that Dragon's Lair was them and that Mr. T was them, even though it wasn't. No, it's just I, how no, 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 I, 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 that's, I don't think that's them. That's Rankin Bass. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's Rankin Bass. Yeah, Rankin they Bass. are, but what I'm saying is it's just when they were released on DVD, they were credited as Hanna-Barbera Productions. Mm. Well, that's mainly because like later on, I think Hanna-Barbera got some of the properties of Rankin Bass, actually. Because Dragon's Lair was Ruby Spears because it was part of Saturday Supercade. Yeah. yeah, Ruby Spears, that's what I meant, not Rankin Which Bass. Which is um, really funny, because um, oh, I've forgotten their full names now. I think it's Joe Ruby and Ken Spears. They actually started as sound sound effects men for Yogi Bear in the, 90, in the early 1960s. Mm-hmm. So they actually started with Hanna-Barbera, you know, yeah. the way that um, some of the early animators would start with Disney or something. Yeah, and, and of course... I th- I think that termite cartoon that uh, Morgan was talking about in Huckleberry Hound, that was actually animated by a Disney animator. Bugs, 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 bugs. <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there were some uh, Disney animators that did actually ended up working at Hanna-Barbera. And, of course, we can't forget the pinnacle point in the 90s when they did original animated shows for um, Cartoon Network. Of oh, course, yes, there was a lot of stuff. stuff. Yeah, the lot of cartoons. A lot of stuff. Oh. That Easy. thing with the worm, what was that? Earthworm Jim. <laughs> no, not Earthworm Jim, not Earthworm Jim. There was a water cartoon with a fucking worm, and it was the creepiest, weirdest thing I've ever seen. What was it? Oh, yeah, the one with the 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 one with the, uh, the worm that gets stepped on by a human and tries to and tries to seek revenge against them. It's so like basically they took a story. Like basically, it's like a storyboard artist from Ren and Stimpy decided to make his own cartoon, but added too much Ren and Stimpy and not much of his own material, and Searching. it just it was it was bad. <laughs> it was it I was mean... nightmare fuel. It was painful. Morgan, you watch it, you'll suffer for it. Believe me, you will not get it out of your head. That cartoon is fucked up. Trust yeah, me, the, it's the worst. The oh, yeah, you ain't seen nothing yet. This is for kids, all right. Sorry, Michael. Have you shown um? Have you shown Morgan the uh ten scares of childhood? Hey, hey, who who remembers uh? I'll watch that. Ship. The Caniferous thing. Yeah. I'll watch that with him at some point as well. Yeah, we'll save that one for now. Mm-hmm. Ooh, was it uh Boyd and Worm? Probably. Is uh, that, yeah, yeah it could be Boyd and Worm. Uh, no, that that's the one where the worm hitchhikes in the middle of California desert with a bird, and the bird. No, that's not it. No, that's not we'll it. Tell, we'll tell you about it later. All right. But yeah, so we so by the end of the by the later uh, portion of the '90s, we have we have uh, the cartoon Cartoon Fridays block, which uh, which consisted of Dexter's Laboratory, Johnny Bravo, Cow and Chicken, the Powerpuff Girls, and I Am Weasel. And I, I love believe, those. Yes. Yeah. Love those. Wait, wait, wait! I found the name of it. It's Tales of Worm Paranoia. Tales of Worm Paranoia. That's it. That's it. Uh, I can see the images in my mind. (laughs) I've always said about. Okay. Oh, hey, Ralph Bakshi did one called Malcolm and Melvin. Do you need a Steffi cuddle, Michael? I'm quite all right for now, thank you. I think I'll survive. Just. First time that I, first time that I, first time that I heard about this particular block, at least the first ones that are coming that were coming on, uh, was actually at the tail end of the videotape 
uh, version for Cats Don't Dance, which is a, an underrated classic of a film. And ter- terrific animation also. Mm-hmm. And it, it was a little bit off-putting because I just sat through this, this movie that had a terrific, uh, very Tex Avery sort of manic an- animated style with a lot of great posing and whatnot. And then, and then you look at televised Hanna Barbera after that. After that, and you get an episode episodes of Dexter's Laboratory, Johnny Bravo, and it all looks very cheap in comparison. And as a kid, I found that initially very off-putting. But uh, these were show, these were shows that grew on me. Uh, going through high school, particularly. Mm-hmm. Um, Dexter's Laboratory has uh, has uh, a, a very interesting balance of chemistry between uh, between two a rival brother and sister who are not quite rivals, but uh, but they're very uh, they're at opposite ends of the spectrum. The episode for the ice cream truck was comedy gold, that one. Yes, oh, I remember. Especially that with I... that. Oh, Especially the deadpan postman who's like falling to his death in the most placid way possible. Uh, Whoa. It... Fucking love that cartoon. And Tom Kenny is the ice cream man at the end with his like complete the payoff, freak the payoff, out. The payoff of that with the jar of pennies, that was brilliant. Mm-hmm. Oh, because you're stupid pennies! And then he just lets out that Hulk scream. It was fucking brilliant. <laughs> Love that cartoon. I tell you what, one of the funniest thing I've seen online is someone's put up the the Pepe rap bit from Dexter's Laboratory, and it's you see Dexter laughing and the Pepe rap shoved in his mouth. And what someone's done is they've taken that bit, sped it up. But what makes me laugh the most, and Mike will Mike Gannick will vouch for me, it's a case where they slow it down. And I don't know why, but it's just like, rawr, rawr, rawr. like that just makes me laugh family. my head off. You know? I'm gonna have to look for this one it, now. I'm gonna have to one see this that one. I gotta say right I, now, ooh, one that the... I know that for me and my family, it's always been a favorite. It's the coffee episode where Dee Dee and Dexter discovers coffee. Yeah, and they have a, I they have a that one. episode. I haven't seen that one. At least oh, I don't so, remember it. So good. It it we need so, coffee. It is so good. I'm going to see that one. It, it's great. The, the, the parents drink in, they go off, and then Dexter and Dee get curious. They drink, like, oh, nothing's happening. And then they get wide awake, and they start, of course, doing their daily yeah, like their routine. eyes just like, yeah. like boing, boing. <laughs> oh, oh. Um, I, I think the one, that's, the one that stands out for me the most is the one with Paul Williams, actually. Oh, yeah, that one. Open. Yeah, yes. Open your mouth. Mix my music with your council. And uh, breathe in the good sunshine. Omelette du fromage. Oh, is that the one where there's a dude oh, with an a piano and Dexter's oh, like twiddling knobs on a machine and they somehow do a song? Yes, well, yes, well, that, well, that's, that's the one. I think we remember. That's a great episode. Oh, yeah. Um, and of course, it's, um, who remembers Dexter's penis? What? What? That actually. You're making this up. up. No. No. <laughs> There's one wait, wait, episode. Wait, wait. What? Is it's a fig leaf episode? No, that wasn't even the fig leaf. Are episode. you sure you're not referring to rude removal? No. What oh, are oh, you? Oh, 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 oh! Is this the episode where, like, as soon as he gets a stain on his clothing, something would zap it away, and he just ends up losing all his clothing, and he has to run back home to get more clothing? Oh, wait a minute. Yes, I know what he's talking about now. This is the episode where they, where uh, dad, uh, the dad punishes them by having them switch rooms. So he tries to climb yes! back through, through yes, the air duct. Yes, the room episode. And then when he, co- and then when he comes back out, p- comes back into, to, to Dee Dee's room, at the end of it, he, some, he gets his clothes blown off by a, a gust of wind. And yes, you can, <laughs> They're no Dexter, you're naked. I could I not. I do be- remember that 
episode, actually. I remember this now. The... I do remember this. I cannot believe she's they so got away with this. She's so afraid that she's going to go into the laboratory, but she doesn't. She actually ends up asleep. And they drew... I couldn't believe that they... That that's that was the one issue that I had with this show, is that, like, this is for kids. Like, they... Okay, so they didn't really draw a really good penis on there. It was just a little squiggle. But still, we know what it is. Oh, you don't have any problems with cow and chicken? Oh, I yeah. Have, oh, I have hella problems with cow and chicken. Of mine. Oh, cow and chicken God. didn't show any penises. They got with some no, it had crazy stuff butt. there. Hey, hey, hey. Buffalo it had Girl was a episode. Constant, it was a devil. But yeah. buffalo constant girls. cow butt. I could not look at oh, it. The buffalo, oh, yeah, the buffalo cows. And the red guy. I, I never got to I, see that. They never had that episode in the UK. I, I think I have a copy of it. I don't know why, but my favorite episode, my, my favorite line from the red guy is, Cerebus is my pet. He has three heads. <laughs> Just the way he says it brings the dog on his three heads. If I recall, um, if I recall, uh, what they did was, um, because I've heard that in repeated broadcasts, they would repeat the uh, dentist, the yes. braces episode. Well, yes. that's what they did in the UK. Like, in its initial broadcast, they just repeated orthodontic police instead. Um, so we never actually got um, Buffalo Gals cartoon, but I do remember the barbecue cartoon for Dial and for Monkey, which has since been um, banned from TV. I do remember we got that. Oh, yeah, the spoon. Um, I don't remember the bit with the hot dog mind. <laughs> I mean, I think everyone knows which part I'm talking about. <laughs> Surely. I don't remember it, but it's amazing how in the UK it's like, yeah, we can show cartoon characters getting barbecued alive, but lesbians? No, no but there's this bit where um, Agent Honeydew at the start of the cartoon is about to eat a hot dog, and you got this guy in front of her, like, watching her like, like that. You watch that cartoon, you'll see it. It's there. And it's like, that is what should have banned the episode, but, but they had no qualms over that, but it was everything else. And I was like, what? Because Rob Paulson is playing a gay spoon. I'm surprised no one's brought That's this up That's the so problem? I know no one has brought this up so far, but I know that Johnny Bravo is James Jam. Yeah. It's, uh... Oh, my friend Johnny... Mickey hated Johnny Bravo. Johnny Bravo is the thing, is... The, the reason why I am... I... Grew to grew to enjoy Johnny Bravo is because I I got a little bit of a I got a little bit of a the wrong idea when the fir, when the show first started out when I saw advertisements for it it's like I was like why would they make a show about this guy I hate people like this I hate people who are so yeah. self absorbed who uh, uh, who uh, who think they're all about the hair and whatnot I, everything that that's I exactly Nikki's problem with it. And Nick everything that exactly. I everything that I dislike about the jock stereotype, the idiot uh, who thinks that he's all that, he is he's the big guy. So why would they pro why would they promote this this image? And then I watched the show finally, and I realized it's not promoting that image. It's funny because he's a moron, and, and it's taking the piss out of that image. It's taking the piss out of this character, and. Uh, and uh, just uh, the the way the way that this guy interacts with the real world, I mean, you just have to be like, yeah, he, always, he couldn't um, possibly exist at this level of bonehead. It's uh -huh. there's always it's one like he's, particular. He's like so lovably stupid. Mm -hmm. There's always one particular episode I always remember to quote, if you don't mind. Um, and I think Morgan knows where I'm going with this one. Yes. And so Johnny and the bull lived happily ever after. They traveled to Hollywood, where they went and starred in much famous blockbusters as Dances with Bulls, The Curd Father, The Bulls Brothers, Raging Bull, and of course, Daddy Daddy, There's a Bull in My Pajamas. Somehow, that actually sounds familiar to me, for some reason. It's, it's just, like, it actually I don't know why, it's just the, like, thing. It's just the way that, that narrator, the, the way the narrator delivered that line. And of course, Daddy Daddy, there's a ball in my pajamas. <laughs> it's like David say, Attenborough. I have to say this one line, it's one of my most favourite Your Mama jokes that I found from an episode of Johnny Bravo, where this gorilla escapes from the zoo, and he oh. comes across a burglar, that basically the burglar calls him a fat cat, <laughs> and the 
Coretta's just stomping on this guy going, how oh, dare you call me fire? And the most, most best mama joke ever came out. It was very, your mama says fire the way that. you are high heels, she struck oil. <laughs> that was it for me. I was like, well, actually, I texted my sister that, I was like, yeah, best your mama joke ever. What, actually, one episode that I remember is uh, the one where Johnny Bravo actually crossed over with Donny Osmond, where they had to find a, a babysitter uh... for him. And they do one with Scooby Doo as well, and and uh, Adam West as I himself. Oh, I think yeah. the one episode that I can't oh, forget is um, the one episode that I still have in my mind is where he dates an antelope. I fucking yes. love that one. Oh, yes, that one. it's, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a were antelope, and then the next night over, he, she transforms into a guy. I can't remember his name. Oh no, oh. no, not this yeah. one. No, um, this one he actually dates a legitimate antelope, and like they have problems with yeah, cars yeah, because she's antelope, an antelope and she John, can't fucking John drive. Probably, it was on um, another episode. He dated a werewolf. Yeah, oh, and that's at the right, end of the car, one. and at the end of ah! the episode, he turns into. At the end of the episode, he turns into a fat little annoying guy named Melvin who likes to collect stamps. <laughs> but at the end of the antelope one, um, what happens is um, he gets in a fight with this crab that he actually ordered for his meal at a restaurant, and uh, they end up getting arrested. And it's just like, what the fuck? And it's like, the crab and him are like arguing over the bunks. It's like, the bottom one's mine! Go near it and die! Don't you make me step on you, man! <laughs> it's like... Oh, you make me step on your body. I know this sounds I, like I'm, I'm pretty sure that Seth MacFarlane wrote that one. I know it sounds Sorry. like I'm. I know it sounds like I'm stepping on already explored ground. But does anyone have any say on the live action treatments? Live action. Because because the only oh, ones that the, come to, um... yeah because the only ones that come to mind are the Flintstones, Josie and the Pussycats, uh, Yogi Bear, He Who Must Not Be oh, Named. Those are written by James Gunn. Oh, well, I never saw the Yogi remember. Bear one. Yogi Bear was. Yogi oh, Bear that was. was but you know, Yogi this came out. Cool. This came out in like 2005 in the states or 2004. We didn't actually get this until 2010, and the only reason we got this was because the movie came out. So this is the one good thing that the move that came out of that movie. So yeah, I love no, the movie honestly, for that. The one good, honestly, I would say the one good thing about that Yogi Bear movie is that. Justin Timberlake was surprisingly good as Boo Boo. Yeah. He actually was, yeah. Yeah, it was Dan surprised. Aykroyd, Dan Aykroyd was a bit of a fuck-up because he was just being Dan Aykroyd. Basically, he's, yeah. he's, he's better the, suited for Dragnet. <laughs> here's the only thing about that, that film. I, I felt like they got Yogi and Boo Boo right, but that was about it. Everything else in this... Everything else in this... What, what, were, they, what were they trying to accomplish here... Even Same the 3D storyline, like it, an evil you know. like salesman type guy, and all he made me remember was uh, Sam Beauregard in uh, Willy Wonka. <laughs> I mean, what was with the uh, what was with the uh, the rain? What the ranger is suddenly? He, he, the ranger in the cartoons, he always thought, I always thought maybe he was in his late 30s, uh, early 40s, you know, with the uh, the five o'clock shadow going on the stubble and everything, yeah. and here oh, he's yeah, like. Yeah. He's like a young. He's kind of a. He's kind of a a, a bit of a a pretty boy here. I'm well, not he really. Kind of, not you know what he reminds me of? He reminds me of John Arbuckle in the live action Garfield movies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Brick and Maya. Yeah. Yeah. Brick, yeah. That, it, that no, no, kind no, no, but like specifically that character, not just Brick and Maya. Yeah, but he, uh, you know, he does look like Brick and Maya, but. <laughs> Is it guilty um, to say the only good one that I guess kind of sort of was decent was the Flintstones one? Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it I still problems. don't see what's wrong problems. with that film. Yeah, okay, Rosie O'Donnell, but that's it for me. Like, everything else is fine. Like, Sorry, it's I got cameos from, it's got cameos from William Hanna, Joseph Barbera, Gene Vanderpile, and one thing that wasn't touched and, on uh, and, in and, the um and Harvey Corman. Of course. The one thing that wasn't touched upon for the Viva Rock Vegas review with Nostalgia Critic, the guy who actually who was playing the guy, you know, in the wedding. Do you take Mr. this woman to your wife? That was John Stevenson. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, it's like nobody noticed that. I mean, the voice. I'm gonna have to watch my review again see if I reference that. But of course, Jean Vanderpile um, in the Flintstones movie, she could be seen doing the conga with um, mm. Dino. Yeah, I remember that. After Fred fires Barney. Yeah. 
I, I, I will like... say, I will say the they did air a longer version on television. I have a copy of it. Some of the stuff they cut out, they should have kept it in. There's a great mm-hmm. scene where Fred, after Fred fires Barney, goes out to have a little talk, and they smooth things over just a little bit, and it's very well done for a character piece. I, I think that I've version. Had... I think that scene's in the UK version. I'll have to double check because. There was definitely a lot more dialogue between the two, like Fred mentioning his troubles and stuff, and how he didn't want to fight or bar and all that sort of stuff. It would have made oh, a right. Lot of difference. Right, no, that bit wasn't there. No, I'll, I'll definitely dig that cut up when I go to Florida. Just you, were all about, you were talking about Yogi Bear, all I've got going through my head is, Give me back that phone, you moron! And then, like, and then... Hey, how do you like racist myth? Medium rare, Yogi. I have to go with that. And I will say there was a great bit too that they cut out with <laughs> Wilma and Betty. They try to go into the Mr. Sweet played the the steal the bird, and they have to get past the guard. So Betty seduces um no no it's Wilma that seduces the guard, and the guard's like a crow magnon. So you see Betty rudging around with these rocks and stuff trying to knock the crow magnet security guard out, and it fails. Then third time he finally falls down. This all sounds really good. I wish they had kept it in. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely bring that down when we visit. But um. Does anyone, remember becoming... the very... Does, anyone Sorry, remember the... Does anyone remember the very last production they did? I think it was the Flintstones on the Rocks. I do remember that one. I don't think I got all the way through it. <sighs> but I do remember. Uh, I I do remember the um, uh, the the little lady from uh, the Poltergeist movie makes a uh, makes an appearance in the beginning <laughs> as a psychiatrist. Will my natural redhead redhead? Mm-hmm. No, it was supposed to be a turn back to the adult version of the show when it was in its prime time. So it was No Pebbles and Bam Bam. It was done by uh, Gendy Tafoski, and it was done for television. It aired a couple of times, and that was about it. Do you, mean, like... Gendy... Do you mean Gendy Tartakovsky? Yeah, so it did Samurai Jack yes. and Powerpuff Girls. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, no, not Powerpuff Girls, Dex- yeah. Dexter's Laboratory. Dexter's Thank you, Dexter's Laboratory. You're thinking of Craig McCracken. That's right. My mistake. He, yeah, I almost screwed that one up big time. Um, oh, don't worry about it. But no, I remember that being like a great love letter to like the original variation of the Flintstones before it became family friendly and stuff. And it's actually kind of interesting. There's a diamond heist in there. They go to like a, a hotel to try and rekindle their marriage. There's a little bit of that dark adult humor. There's a great bit where Fred and Wilma are in bed, not even talking to each other. And then you hear Fred and Betty in the other room going, ha, 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 and like the bed shaking and everything. Mm hmm. Yes, we do see ha- that, Mike. Do they have Wilma swearing in it? No. But, but, it, but, 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 it does end in the best joke possible. Uh, Fred and Wilma decide to rekindle, and it ends with them, like, turning the vibration of the bed on, implying that they're doing rock. And you pan under the bed, and you see this little monkey shaking the bed, and he turns to the camera and goes, Eh, it's 11. <laughs> <laughs> well, shit. Yeah, that's a good way to I'm close the era. That. It's only an hour long, so I'm definitely bringing that. And like, there's a great gag with the the robbers trying to get, because he steals a diamond and it actually ends up with the Flintstones. And Willow thinks it's an engagement ring, and so the robbers trying to get it back. And there's a great scene where he's seducing her, and she mentions how she likes classy guys. And you see the robber poke out of the bush and goes, "You are classy, lady. I'll show you classy." <laughs> Well, good luck. Good luck trying to get Dan to watch it because he's been very anti Hanna Barbera lately, um, in recent uh-huh. years. Oh, he'll probably he'll probably cave in if it comes down to a vote because I'm not going to say no. Oh, don't worry. There's a lot of adult jokes in here that'll keep him awake. So, uh, perhaps uh, given time constraints and all that, perhaps we should start uh, wrapping things up now. Then. Final well, thoughts. I just want to throw one last thing in on here, possibly. Uh, in defense of Tom and Jerry the movie. <laughs> alright, that's all for today, folks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's alright. I mean, the film is... The film's bad, but it's like, you can still enjoy it for what it is. I've not seen it since I was young, so I can't say much about it. The... I mean, it does have problems. I mean... Yeah. It, it's still completely watchable. <laughs> My opinion... It's good, but couldn't have been better. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, what I'm gonna say. Like, like yeah. the first fifteen minutes are fine because they don't talk. <laughs> well, you have to look at it this way. Uh, I think when they were making this, they just said, um, 
we're trying to knock off the Disney formula, and that's about it. Which, which is something that is improved upon upon when it comes to the later Tom and Jerry movies. But that's yeah. all I. Uh, what can I say? When I was a kid, I always thought I always thought that when they when Tom and Jerry talked, it was kind of like, oh wow, that's amazing. Seriously, I had like a little. True. I had like yeah, a little I felt like that. Yeah, I, th- I think I, I can definitely see where the basis for Maury came one. Now you bring that up. I like I like the I um, like the idea that they went for a, a male actor with Tom and then a female actor for Jerry. I Dana like Hill, that yeah. because it, it worked pretty well. Hey, uh, yes. The, the guy who played Tom in that was Malt in a Bug's Life. That threw me off. Yeah. Uh, he was Bing, Bingo Bongo in uh, in Inside Out. That's Bing the bong. same guy. Bing Bong, oh, you wow. fool. Bing Bong. Never would have thought that'd happen. Bing bong. Yes, one of the... again babe so yes that is the end of the podcast it's been 90 minutes worth of randomness and hair barbara latest stuff maybe can i just say the comic reboots they've been doing are actually kind of interesting just not the art style oh yeah yeah Mm -hmm. though i will admit the flintstones ones actually kind of what about snagglebush (laughs) though i will admit the flintstones one's been kind of interesting there's a really great issue where they think the world's gonna end, and there's this Carl Sagan guy that's like, "All oh, my calculations are correct." And you see, it's this little, one of those little counter things on strings and stuff, but they're moths instead of rocks. Yeah, but so, it's just as Steph said, Oscar Snag doesn't quite work. Yeah. Yeah. So. I'm coining that term. That's copyrighted. I like that. I do like the Dick Tracy um, version of Fred Flintstone. Yes. Yeah. Yes. If any, if any of the other artwork gets botched up, we'll have to get the Jesus balls out again. Mm-hmm. Thank God they're not doing Seth MacFarlane's reboot. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry, it's not gonna happen. It's no, gonna happen. he's doing yeah. his. He's doing another thing right now, which is a, yeah. a Star Trek parody show. So. Yeah. He's apparently, to it. Uh, uh, yeah. Apparently, he's ripping off Galaxy Quest now. Fair make, enough. Make sure both. You, 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 you go from Blazing Saddles to Galaxy Quest. Wonderful. <laughs> what? Wait. Seth he had MacFarlane? a million... Yeah, he did A Million Ways to Die in the West. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. I only laughed at the Gilbert Godfrey cameo, and that was it. Mm. He, he, he appears as Abraham Lincoln at their graduation. I got schmucks four scores and seven years ago I was poor like you, and now I'm so fucking rich I can get all the licorice I want. I don't think that's the precedent. Wait, when are we starting the podcast? <laughs> a long time ago in a galaxy far, far a fucking way, Steph. <laughs> so yes, thank you. So maybe next time we'll revisit this possibly. There's a lot we did not cover, of course, with all the stuff we talked about. So uh, next time... I could have gone on another three hours, believe me. I know. They had a ride. They had, they had an amusement park theme ride. I know. There was a lot to talk about that we missed. So maybe we'll come back to this I've sometime. i flash in my eye now. Yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, Next time, for the rest of us, we're going to check out Summer Blockbusters, since it's the summer season here for uh, movies now. So we talk about Summer Blockbusters. and uh... get, get your sunscreen. And get... It's going to be a very raged episode. And I get put back in the Cinema Royale closet until November, isn't it? Right? I'll probably have a layer of dust on me. You know. <laughs> Something like that. I'll, I'll remind folks when you come on. They're going to make sure I'm fed and watered. And I get my exercise. Steph? Steph, if you're going back in the closet, can I visit you once in a while? Of course you can. But you need to ask the pup, the keeper, like if she's being put in a cupboard. Yeah, we might have to arrange it with Mike. I think I'll just stick to doing artwork for the next few years. (laughs) Thank you. Don't look at me. I got newspaper articles to write. Thank you for listening to this episode, dummy. Please tell me in the comments below what is your favorite Hanna-Barbera production of any sort. And uh, 
like this video if you liked it and check out all these guys youtube morgan's matt's and james's it's definitely my girlfriend's staff she's got great youtube she just uploaded a vlog and michael kempton he's got great artwork very good artist indeed and thank you for listening goodbye good night, dumb, good night dum dums ta ta <laughs> i'm not drunk I'm still awake. Did he just go? Did he just go stage up? Oh, yeah. Exit he stage up staged left. himself.